Well, hi, everyone. I'm Gary Locke. I'm the chair of the Committee of 100. We want to welcome all of our guests to this webinar focused on the AAPI curriculum. Uh, we have really some great uh, panelists with us. Uh, our moderator is um, Stuart Kuo, who's the President Emeritus, founder and past president and executive director of the Asian Americans for Advancing Justice uh, out of Los Angeles. And our panel members are state legislators from Nevada, uh, Natha Anderson, a first time first term Democrat uh, from Rhode Island, uh, state legislator Barbara Ann Fenton Fung, uh, first term legislator Republican, uh, and Dr. Russell Jung, uh, who's a professor at San Francisco State University. Uh, I'm the chair of Committee 100, and we're so pleased to be sponsoring this webinar talking about AAPI curriculum in our public schools. When we really think about it, uh, Asian Americans have given their blood, sweat, and tears for this country. Uh, they are part and parcel for, of the prosperity of America. They've fought in our conflicts, in our world wars, uh, and they have contributed mightily to the building up of industries, of cities, of academia, uh, and so much of what we take for granted in this country. And yet I have to say that uh, not many people know about the struggles and the history of Asian American Pacific Islanders. The history and the story of AAPIs is really the story of America. And to really understand America uh, as we move forward, as we deal with the complex challenges facing our communities, our nation, and even the world, we need to understand and appreciate the contributions, the history, the struggles of all the diverse elements within American society. And clearly that includes the Asian American Pacific Pacific Islander community. I have to confess that when I was growing up, I in, in all of high school, I knew nothing about the Asian American or the Asian the Chinese Exclusion Act. I never even saw in the history books anything about the internment of the Japanese. And I knew nothing about even the contributions of Chinese Americans in terms of the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. So it's important that we begin to have curriculum that really gives a full story, the full portrait of America. Uh, and I'm really pleased that so many groups across the country are working on uh, modifying our textbooks, including materials that our educators can use. But it's one thing to have materials available, but what are the policies of our states and our local school boards and districts in terms of using uh, the materials that are being assembled and being updated uh, and being created uh, to use in the classroom? Uh, how do we make sure that the history of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are really brought forth in the classroom? And so with that, I turn it over to uh, Stuart Kuo, who's gonna moderate this great panel sponsored by the Committee of 100 in terms of AAPI curriculum in our schools. Thank you all for joining us. Stuart, take it away. Thank you, Gary, and we uh, really appreciate your leadership over many years. Um, Gary, as you know, is a former governor, uh, former uh, ambassador, um, a leader in our community in many different ways. Um, so <clears throat> let me just uh, briefly mention what we're going to do tonight. Uh, Gary mentioned our panelist, uh, Natha Anderson, uh, Nevada Assembly, Nevada Assemblywoman, District 30, Barbara Ann Fenton Jung Fung, uh, Rhode Island State Representative, um, Russell Jung, a Professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State and co-founder of the Stop API Hate. Um, and then we also have a, a recorded message from Irene Parisi, Chief Academic Officer of the Connecticut Department of Education, and uh, myself, Stuart Quo. Uh, I'll introduce myself as Co-Executive Director of the Asian American Education Project, which I'll explain a little later. Uh, so then uh, before we have our panelists, we're going to have an overview of the research by the Committee of 100 um, on API curriculum. And then we'll have the panelists uh, give an opening remark. And then we'll go into a series of questions that I have um, prepared. 
so why don't we turn immediately to the C100 uh, presentation on the research uh, findings. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Liz Kerr, and I lead public policy and oversee research here at Committee 100. In a little bit, as we've talked about, you're going to hear from some education experts and state legislators who understand deeply the importance of ethnic studies in K-12 schools and how the rise in anti-Asian hate has really fueled a focus on AAPI ethnic studies. But before we get started with that broader discussion, we really wanted to share our state of play analysis on what AAPI education requirements look like across the country. So last summer after Illinois became the first state in the nation to enact a standalone law that required AAPI curriculum in their K-12 schools, we wondered what other states were doing. We also knew that California and a bunch of other states had made some progress on this, um, on broader ethnic studies curriculum. So we thought there might be more going on, and, and there was. So here at Committee of 100, we aren't teachers, so we don't claim to be experts on how to teach AAPI studies or the, necessarily the exact topic students should learn. But what we do try to do is educate the general public about public policy issues that are important to the Chinese American and Asian American Pacific Islander community. Uh, and when we started to talk to folks about this topic and these new laws, we heard from so many people, just like Gary said earlier tonight, that they both wish that they had the opportunity to learn about Asian, Asian American history and culture when they were in school, but also that they were really thrilled that their kids might actually have that opportunity. So as uh, most of you on this webinar probably know, in the US, K-12 curriculum is set by state and local, local education authorities and not by the federal government. So we looked around and we saw that there was a lot of research into, again, what this curriculum should look like, the topics students should learn and about their pedagogy and about the importance of starting ethnic studies at an early age. But we also realized there wasn't a clear outline of what states had made what progress and what state legislatures and education departments across the country were doing. So um, Grace, why don't you share the uh, map slide now? I think that's slide three. So we embarked on a project to literally map out what states had passed AAPI curriculum bills, which had pending legislation to create those requirements like Illinois, and then um, you know where there was room for progress. So um, what we found was really interesting. Uh, while Illinois and New Jersey, as we all know, and now um, our, our uh, analysis um, ended on March 1st, so we, we had to pick a stop date. And since then, Connecticut and Rhode Island have um, also rightfully made some headlines over the last year for enacting standalone legislation to require AAPI studies curriculum. We found that a number of other states already require AAPI studies through other means, like broader ethnic studies legislation or Department of Education mandated standards. So I know that sounds complicated. And what I mean by that is states like Colorado, for example, have AAPI studies in place as a result of broader ethnic studies laws that, specific, that specify AAPI studies should be part of social studies curriculum, along with, for example, Black history and Latino American history. Uh, additionally, we found that 10 more states, we found 10 more states where education officials used authority granted to them in broad ethnic studies laws to then specify themselves when they wrote the curriculum requirements for the state, that those should include AAPI history and culture. Um, so this is great news. When we consider all these other avenues, we find that 18 states currently require instruction on AAPI history. Uh, it's a much higher number than is usually reported in the media, and it really shows the value of considering alternative method methods to, pr to pursuing these curriculum requirements. Uh, this means that the states require um, students learn about Asian American history and culture, but the laws don't specifically say that. So we completely agree and understand that codifying requirements like this is the best way to go, but we want advocates and state legislators to all, you know, consider all the different paths at their disposal. So Grace, why don't we go to um, the finding slide? I'm gonna cover a few quick stats from our report and then turn it over to the panel discussion. Again, I'll note that we completed our research in March. So these numbers do not include the recent laws passed by Connecticut and Rhode Island. So overall through March 1st of this year, seven states meet what we consider the gold standard for um, 
AAPI education requirements. And that means that their state education authorities have written into their curriculum that AAPI studies should be included. It also means that that is backed up by statutes. So either a standalone AAPI um, bill like those passed in Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Jersey, and Illinois, or in a broader ethnic studies bill that, that specifies AAPI history and culture, probably along with Black, Latino, and Native American history. Um, there are 10 states where education officials have used broader ethnic, uh, um, broader authority under existing ethnic studies bills. And then there are 35 states that have ethnic studies requirements in place. Um, some of those include states where there are API studies and some don't. Um, so what we, and those are states where there's an opportunity to perhaps uh, obviously pursue the standalone AAPI studies bills, but also to consider what authority those education officials uh, might have just to write new curriculum requirements into, uh, into their state regulations. Uh, so what we really wanna stress here is that there isn't a one size fits all plan that is right for every state. And we really encourage again, legislators and advocates to continue pushing for these API studies bills, as well as pursue action with state education officials. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions later on tonight or set up one-on-one -on -one calls with anybody who wants a much deeper dive into that data. But now I'm gonna hand it back to Stuart and state legislators um, who really know what it's like to try to pass these bills on the ground. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that uh, insightful study. And thank you to the staff and the uh, interns and uh, people who worked on that survey. Um, I, let's get into our panel and then uh, I'll ask each panelist to give three to five minutes as an introductory statement. And then uh, I will um, uh, ask a few questions of the uh, panelists. If we have time, we'll go to uh, the um, we'll go to the uh, questions from the audience. But um, thank you all for joining us, and let's uh, get into it right away. And let's start off with Natha. Natha. Thank you so much. And uh, I just, again, want to thank uh, Governor, Ambassador um, Mock, as well as Liz and the entire community of uh, the Committee of 100, 100. You guys have been wonderful to work with for this. And I'm so sorry. You might also see my cat every once in a while. So please accept my apology for Paddington. Um, so I am, I'm a freshman legislator from the Nevada, state of Nevada. And in my real life, I'm a teacher. And one thing that I was always taught as a teacher when I started 25 years ago is that the literature as well as textbooks that we choose should be both a window as well as a mirror. It should be a mirror to reflect our students as well as a window into a different world. So that way they become much more aware of things. And I think what Governor Locke had brought up is such a good point. We need to be aware that our history is varied. And we need to be aware of Manzanar. Uh, for example, if you've never had a chance to read Farewell to Manzanar, please do so. I'm an English teacher, so I, I get a chance to teach that. We need to not only be aware of our history, but we also need to be aware that it's not always something that um, we should celebrate. It's something that we should be aware of so we do not go there again. Uh, I brought forward Assembly Bill 261 last session, uh, both because of my world as a, as a teacher but more importantly, because I had groups of students from our state who came forward and said that they wanted this. Uh, the students would not be helped by it because uh, four of the students were on their road to graduate that year, and two more had already graduated, and one was a junior. And yet, they still were very much uh, passionate about how important it is that their education be a reflection of the society we live in. And I can still remember um, Mia, who was a, was a junior at the time. She's now going to be a freshman. I think she's going uh, to Pacific next year. And Mia stood up uh, during the session and during the committee hearing and said that she was embarrassed about her history because she'd never heard about it in her history classes as an eighth grader. And it was not until she was an 11th grader that she had somebody that looked like her that taught her. And so she finally had a chance to be able to start seeing some other a literature, in this case, it happened to be Latina uh, literature. But I think that that is the most important message is that we need to empower our students 
as well as our community to realize that we have varied points of view and it's important that we embrace all of them and have a chance to have those conversations. Uh, I'm more than happy to discuss a little bit more about my bill because really it's just a one step of a very long process where um, the literature as well as the history textbooks and the science textbooks must take into a account more than one point of view. And that's, that's really at this time where the bill is going. Um, we are in discussions about extending more and more of that into uh, requiring classes, but those are at this time discussions because of some other things that are going on in our state. Uh, more than happy to have answer some questions and engage in further discussion and also looking forward to uh, hearing from others. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Natha. We'll, we'll get back to uh, some of the contents of your bill in a moment, but uh, now let's hear from Barbara. Uh, Barbara Ann Fenton Fung, uh, the Rhode Island State uh, Representative. Barbara. Oh, thanks so much, Stuart. And thanks to the Committee 100, Ambassador Locke. Um, we were joking earlier, I think uh, my husband and I are the first husband-wife team on a C100 webinar. Many of you will know my husband, Alan Fung, was a mayor um, up here in Rhode Island for 12 years and is now running for Congress. So yes, there, as you see the name, there is the relation there. Um, so I'm happy to, to talk about how we push through, um, House Bill number is called 7272A. Um, it, we were trying to grab a, an eight for lucky numbers. It just never worked out when we were getting those uh, house numbers assigned. Um, it is one thing I'd like to, to talk about because I second everything that Natha said, especially when it comes from an education standpoint. Um, by trade, I work in healthcare. I've taught at the college level, but never in this realm. I, I taught things like neuroanatomy, but the principles are the same. You want to make sure that your world is being reflected and accurately and holistically. Um, but when we get to the actual legislating, it's a, it's a very <laughs> cutthroat process. Politics is not a spectator sport. And if there's one thing I can say to, to hammer home tonight is that is that it requires the energy and engagement of many, many different groups in order not only to have your bill filed, but to get attention um, and then in most legislatures across the state, it has to, across the country, it has to pass not only the House, but also the Senate. And so how did we in Rhode Island become the fourth state um, to get this across the finish line when there has never been an Asian American legislator in the House or the Senate? Um, and it, I'll say it right now, you need to have a lot of strong allies. Um, obviously, myself being married to the first Asian American everything here in Rhode Island um, from a government standpoint, um, I am very easily accessible and I have great relations with not only the Rhode Island Association of Chinese Americans, but national organizations like UCA, like C100, um, Lonnie out of New York, Make Us Visible nationwide. There were lots of different groups that came forward and helped us push um, the importance of this bill. Again, when you don't have any Asian Americans um, in your legislature, sometimes you can say, oh, are you just, are you putting this bill in for a constituent? That's fine, you know, like, okay. But I needed to build on the momentum of a, a year prior, we had passed uh, education requirements telling the African-American, Black American story. And I knew if we didn't get this going soon, it would be a harder and harder bill to get through over the next few years. Um, there's nothing like a little bit of pressure to get things going in politics. Um, so I engaged on the Senate side, uh, a wonderful ally, uh, her name is Senate State Senator Sandra Cano. She has a ton of Asian Americans in her city that she represents. And the important thing is we were both on the education committees in our chambers. And so we were able to have a much bigger voice. So when you're looking for people to sponsor these bills, make sure they actually sit on the education committee. You'll have a much easier time uh, moving this forward. And then there were certain things that came up along the way that were just kind of funny. Um, the first time this bill was scheduled to be heard was actually right in the middle of Chinese New Year. And I, I had to go to the, the chairman and I had to go to the speaker. I was like, I was like, guys, it's hard to get everybody to come and testify because this is a really important holiday. And just little things like that, they didn't understand. They're like, oh, well, can't they just come up? You know, I was like, this is this is a deeply religious holiday. And we want to make sure um, that people can come and engage. So we had to move 
the, the starting point forward a little bit. And um, so there were, there were little bits along the way that actually educated a lot of members of our chamber who, like Ambassador Locke had said earlier, had never heard of the Chinese Exclusion Act. I had state legislators who were history teachers themselves. And they're like, yeah, I mean, I've heard of it, There's, but we don't teach it or anything about the Japanese uh, American internment during World War II. So it, it was kind of an education session also for fellow state legislators. And um, it took a lot of work and a lot of local engagement and a lot of continued pressure um, to make sure this bill kept going through. In Rhode Island, we have, uh, it's a very small population of Asian Americans. It's only about 3.6%. But a good portion of that is also Southeast Asians. So we wanted to make sure that their views were um, heard as well. So Cambodians, Laotians, Vietnamese, alongside the amazing efforts of our Chinese Americans, um, it, it really helped to move this through. The specific thing that makes our bill a little bit different than, say, Illinois, is yes, while we talk about the tremendous wrongs that have been um, brought upon Asian Americans in this country's history, and there's been a lot. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we were celebrating the successes in athletics, in the arts, in science, in technology, because the way you combat anti-Asian bias is by seeing the, the group in a different light, right? And showing all the wonderful things that they've brought to this country. And I think that that's really important. So not only did we say it had to celebrate the amazing accomplishments, but also put in a local aspect as well, celebrating Rhode Island and New England, um, Chinese and, and Asian Americans as a whole. So lots of different um, aspects of a bill I'll be happy to talk to you about in the Q&A. But just remember that when you're trying to get these bills through, you need to have really strong advocates that are going to make it a priority, one of their top one or two bills this session. And it's not a spectator sport. We need you guys to come out and testify and send letters and constantly let your legislators know um, that this this bill means something to you, and they'll they'll get it. A little bit of pressure goes a long way. So thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Barbara. Appreciate that. Uh, very important lessons to to be learned. Um, now I'd like to turn to Russell. Uh, Russell is a national uh, figure um, with the Stop API movement, and um, did a lot of the data gathering. But he's also uh, followed the. Uh, advocacy around uh, legislation. So, um, Russell, please go ahead. Thanks a lot, Stuart. And I'm also glad to be here with the Committee of 100. And I applaud the Committee of 100 for this excellent report. It's comprehensive. It's almost up to date, um, if you include Connecticut and Rhode Island. And um, it's a real resource for our community. I'd like to talk about how um, this movement for Asian American studies and narratives in our curriculum um, has developed over the last year and what we've learned as we studied this growing movement. Um, as most of you know, there's been a huge surge in anti-Asian racism and that's what set the context. So nine states now um, have required Asian American studies and narratives. And five of those um, states just passed the legislation in this past year. So you could understand that the anti-Asian hate has really provided the impetus, has galvanized the community, and has made um, legislators more responsive um, to our issues. And so, as the previous speaker said, we have a limited window when Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are now in the attention, and we have to institutionalize um, these efforts as soon as we can. To tell you quickly about the racism that we've been receiving um, or hearing about, we have a website that collects firsthand accounts from Asians and Pacific Islanders about the, um, what we're experiencing during COVID-19. To date, we've received about 11,500 incidents, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Our national representative survey last year found that one out of five Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders experienced some form of hate in the past year. So that's 4 million cases of hate. And these cases are really traumatizing. So I'm arguing this is a period of collective racial trauma. The racism aren't all hate crimes, but they fall under four main categories. Um, civil rights violations, such as work discrimination or refusal of service make up 
online racism, cyber racism, make up 9% of our cases. And our young people who are on screens a lot, our students um, experience this often. 70% of AAPI youth say they've seen something stereotypic or offensive in the last month. So they're experiencing indirect racism. Microaggressions such as harassment make up the bulk of the incidents. Two thirds of our cases involve harassment. And then the final category is physical assault for which you could possibly prosecute for a hate crime. Um, the trends have been really consistent. Our communities are being racially profiled even though people blame China for the COVID-19 um, pandemic. 57% of our respondents are non-Chinese. So they're mostly people who are East Asian who look Chinese, Koreans, Vietnamese, but a Latino in LA was punched and told to go back to China. An indigenous person was attacked in Vancouver and told to go back to China. So it's clear racial profiling and half of our cases involve people making anti-Chinese remarks. Bullies attack whom they think are, are vulnerable so that our youth and elderly and women are more often targeted. And finally, there is an intersectional experience that those who are working class experience twice the racism. Um, and you can understand that because they're essential workers who don't have the privilege of working at home online. They have to interface with the public. And as a consequence, they get, they face a lot more anti-Asian harassment. So uh, this is the context, this surge of anti-Asian racism has been devastating and traumatizing. But the positive note is that our Asian American community has really stood up in this moment. We've made our message heard. Most Americans recognize that education is the best way to combat racism. And that's why you're seeing so many bills being passed at this moment. And um, we at Stop API Hate have been interviewing um, legislators like Natha and um, um, Fen Fang. And we've learned some of the common strategies of if you want to um, pass this type of legislation in your state. And I'm just gonna quickly share with you what these states have in common. Like Rhode Island, almost everybody has created and developed an Asian American studies bill based on previous ethnic studies legislation that had already passed. A lot of states have passed African American studies. And so we just sort of stand on their shoulders and say, you've passed educational bills for Latinos, let's do one for Asian Americans. So you just copy a successful mo uh, model or a successful bill. Almost all the states have had API legislators or legislators with large AAPI constituencies author the bill. And like the legislators here today, they know the inside um, ways to, um, build coalitions with other legislators. They know how to um, work the system and that has been really helpful. Again, every state that has passed legislation have built a coalition and have actually started from a strong network of Asian American organizations. So um, people have built on civil rights groups, faith-based groups, student groups, and by coming together as an Asian American network, we've been able to um, really effectively advocate. The best spokespersons we found are those directly impacted by these bills. So having youth speak has been particularly effective. And parents, parents know that one out of three Asian parents report their kids being bullied. So they have a self-interest, a public health interest, not just an education um, interests to get these bills passed. So use parent groups, uh, um, organize and mobilize your youth to be spokesperson. And again, most of these states have used the anti-Asian hate framing as a way um, to support passage of these bills. We're not saying, oh, Asian American studies is for critical thinking. We're not saying Asian American studies um, improves academic performance, although it does. We're framing the issue is that if you want to stop hate, if you want to stop bullying, then you need to pass this legislation. And that's the frame, that's the narrative that's working at this moment. And finally, a lot of the states 
have um, gotten a lot of local support from other school districts who pass resolutions for these statewide bills. So we found these six strategies have been utilized by almost all the states that have passed this um, type of legislation in the last year. And you could find a lot of um, these resources, what we've been learning, models of curriculum um, at our website, Asian American Research Initiative. So thanks a lot. And I look forward to the question and answers. Sure. Thank you, Russell. Uh, very important lessons. Uh, now we, uh, I, I'd like to say a few words um, on implementation. But before I do that, uh, why don't we turn to Irene Parisi who, from Connecticut, who uh, is also going to be working on the curriculum? Hello, I am Irene Parisi, Chief Academic Officer for the Connecticut State Department of Education. And I am honored to have this opportunity to speak to you about the statewide commitment to providing model curricula for all learners in Connecticut. The CSDE believes that curricula from a culturally responsive perspective require intentional planning for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the development of units and implementation of lessons. It is critical to develop a learning environment that is relevant to and reflective of students' social, cultural, and linguistic experiences to effectively connect their culturally and community-based knowledge to the class. Connecticut believes that the identities of those living in the state matter and should be recognized. 50% of our students identify as an ethnicity other than white. Therefore, it is critical that knowledge and appreciation of these identities begin with our students. Connecticut was the first state in the nation to require all high schools in the state to offer an elective course on African-American, Black, and Puerto Rican Latino studies. All schools will be engaged this upcoming school year. Beginning in fall of 2023, all secondary schools in Connecticut must offer instruction on the history, culture, and contributions of Native Americans in Connecticut. And beginning in the fall of 2025, all secondary schools in Connecticut must offer instruction on the history and culture of the Asian American Pacific Islander community, both in Connecticut and throughout the United States. There are numerous secondary school students, secondary school teachers, and university level educators and community members who have already come forward and asked to assist in the creation of Asian American Pacific Islander curricular materials. The critical importance of the Asian American Pacific Islander curricular materials that will be created is shown by the increase in hate crimes against Asian Americans across the United States. Racism and hatred comes from a lack of knowledge and respect for one another. Once students know more about the history and culture of groups other than their own, they are more likely to view others positively. Instruction of this nature also assists in reducing long lasting stereotypes that exist in our society. In alignment with the Connecticut State Board of Education, we want all of our students to graduate as responsible, well-rounded, and productive citizens who are ready to engage with others and thrive in our interconnected, diverse global society. Our students are best served when empowered with the tools to understand and investigate the countless lived experiences that exist in the world around them. We believe and fully support fostering inclusive, and culturally responsive educational environments that welcome, respect, and acknowledge the individual identities of all members of a school community as a cornerstone of preparing each and every student to succeed in college, career, and civic life. The Connecticut State Department of Education with all community partners, including you all, is excited by the opportunity to develop curricular resources that are designed by the cultural assets of each community and organization. More inclusive, culturally relevant content translates to greater student engagement and improved student outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Uh, we'll post everybody's emails later on uh, so uh, the audience can reach out to uh, our panelists as well as C100. 
Uh, let me make a few comments. Um, again, I'm Stuart Kuo. Uh, I mainly go by, I'm co-executive director of the Asian American Education Project now, which uh, unlike um, what the speakers are talking about, is not focused on advocacy, but is focused on implementation. So I'd like to make a few comments on implementation to round out the panel. Uh, also, I'd like to say I'm a proud member of the Committee of 100. So I'm very proud that they're doing this very important research. Um, first of all, I would just like to, as an observer and also a partner of some of the groups, I applaud their efforts, especially on advocacy, uh, especially groups like Make Us Visible, uh, actually passed, helped to pass five bills in three states, including uh, Connecticut, New Jersey, and Rhode Island. Uh, Barbara had mentioned them as one of the groups, uh, but what stands out about the Make Us Visible is they really uh, focus on building the community coalition that Russell talked about. Uh, in fact, um, one of their uh, key uh, leaders, uh, Jeff Gu, uh, just reminded me that uh, in Colorado, they've removed Asian American studies as part of the standards. So the community coalition has to come together uh, immediately, but I've been very impressed with their work and uh, probably 20 states have uh, advocates who have contacted them. And so they're working uh, on that immediately as well as the Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago uh, really led the way to uh, pass the first uh, mandatory bill. So uh, we partnered with them over the years. Um, on implementation, let me just say that passing these bills is the first step, but the second step is to implement. Um, as uh, speakers indicated, the uh, implementation is left up to the school districts and the schools. So unless you really um, get in with the schools and train the teachers, the instruction of the students isn't going to happen. I'm proud to say we've already trained 2,500 teachers from around the country. Uh, we have seven trainers. We have uh, five people working on curriculum development. Uh, we have 53 lesson plans and we're working with uh, the uh, South Asian uh, Digital Archives Group and Make Us Visible to write six new uh, lesson plans by the end of August on the South Asian community, particularly in New Jersey. Um, we have, so we find that you have to constantly develop these lesson plans and you have to convince the schools and the teachers uh, that they can um, teach this material. Uh, our lesson plans come from a book I co-wrote, um, Untold Civil Rights Stories and the 2020 PBS uh, documentary where we were the lead on the curriculum development. So thus far, uh, I'm uh, just saying we, we would love to hear from you because when you get to the implementation phase, we would love to partner with you, uh, help you in any way we can. Uh, New York has um, asked us to uh, do the first lesson plan, seven lesson plans, in the month of June uh, called Hidden Voices that will be piloted and eventually get to 1800 schools in New York. Uh, we were asked by the LAUSD, the Los Angeles Unified School District to write the first semester long course on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And our trainings have gone anywhere from 20 teachers to 300 teachers. In the month of June, we did two trainings in Las Vegas, Nevada and we had over 600 teachers. Um, and we're working with a group called Launch. And by the fall, we will produce a graphic novel, a 50 to 60 page graphic novel uh, with Marvel DC comic book uh, writers and artists. So we hope to provide that online and a few uh, hard copies. So let me uh, go to um, some of our questions. Um, if the uh, API curriculum is so important because it in the long term can help us stem anti-Asian violence and uh, we truly believe uh, Asian American history is American history. You have 
huge gaps in American history. If you don't understand what Asian Americans have done and what happened to them and how they've struggled and resisted. Um, and of course, there's the growth of Asian Americans, but why is it that you think uh, has been an obstacle in many states in teaching about the history of an important um, part of America? I'll open it up to any panelists. So I'll, I'll jump in first and attempt. What an excellent question. I, I think that there are three reasons. The first, it's fear of getting information wrong. The resources are not out there as we've uh, talked about before. And so getting the resources out there, such as this, this document, which is huge, but then also doing the other research that's been discussed in other areas and getting that to educators, I, I really do think that people like me, we're scared of getting the information wrong. So we wanna make sure that we have correct information. I think number two, pre 90, there was a feeling of fright of um, how do we make sure that we can be, empower everybody? It's difficult to say that, but I have to be realistic with, with our history and also with uh, where we've been. And we need to change that. And the way we do so is to educate each other. The final thing is just awareness. Um, as a high school English teacher, it, it is tough for me to get through all the different books that I wanna teach and that more importantly, that my students should learn. So how do we do that? As an American history teacher, how do you make sure that we do those things? Um, it's not the answer I wanna give, but I, I wanna be as candid as possible with, I think those are the three largest reasons. Again, it's time in the classroom and out of the classroom, understanding and finally a history of fear of being able to open up our eyes to more than one um, accepted, and I put that in quotes, of where we've been. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, do you want to make a, any comment? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that a step further because I, I agree with Natha in, in a sense there. And I some of the other questions that have come up in the chat, I'll kind of go around kind of the same area is, how do you convince people of the importance? And, and what you're looking at here is, there's, there's a big national push when we're talking about, oh, CRT, there's, there's a fear of CRT. And sometimes these conversations um, get interlinked incorrectly. When I tell people who didn't understand why this had to be part of the curriculum, I say, think about your old history book. And there's a, a very famous picture of Promontory Point when they finally linked the railroads together. And I go, did you know that 90% of the people who helped build those railroads were Chinese? And every single person in that picture, when they're doing the big celebratory, you know, here's the last thing, they're all white. And how would you feel if, you know, and again, being the Irish American, it's probably a little easier to have these conversations with some people um, that say like, hey, look, what if someone else took credit for all your work? And all we're saying is, you know what, we want to make sure that the people who blood, sweat, and tears went into building this country in different contributions, that their voice is heard, that they're remembered in the history books, because if they're not memorialized, then that's gone forever. And I think that, and, and I will say this in a, in a way that I mean this is some way we can build onto it. We have to have louder voices from every single group, you know, whether it be Chinese, Southeast Asian, Japanese, Korean, to push and say, these are the real important things that if there's one or two areas of history that I want my kids to know and you know make sure other people understand, it's this. And I think when you put it in, you take out all the, the broad DEI terms and just say, do you understand why when you have issues like that Promontory Point picture, that that means something and that's, that's offensive to some groups and, and this is something we can change. It breaks down those barriers. So I think that's, that's a certain way you can approach it. Yeah I, want to, yeah, I just want to echo what Barbara and um, Natha were, were saying. We're not saying it's an intentional omission necessarily, but it is an omission. And it's our entire educational system is omitting the narratives of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So that omission, you know, like Gary talked about how he never learned anything, in, you know, 
while he was growing up, that omission is institutional racism. So people think, oh, it's racist. People aren't that prejudiced. It's not about people's intentions. It's about um, how institutions themselves, not the teachers, not individuals, but how institutions fail to teach a broad perspective, how institutions fail to include a diverse set of narratives in their literature, in their history. So for me, the omission is actually an example of racism that's not necessarily intentional, but is institutional. Um, some people, like, like Natha said, are really being fear-based now. And I think the critic, anti-critical race theory, people are afraid to talk about race. People are feeling offended by discussions of race. So what we need to do, like Barbara just said, is to alleviate people's fears and to show a discussion about race, learning about diverse groups isn't offensive or um, polarizing, but rather can be uplifting, can be um, develop empathy, and can develop critical thinking. So um, it is an omission that's racist, but I think we can um, help America become anti-racist by including more narratives. Uh, I Thank you, Russell. I've been reminded we have eight more minutes. So I want to ask two more questions and then see uh, if we can go further. Uh, one question is, if there is one important lesson learned about pushing your legislation, what is it? Is it overcoming the opponents of the critical race theory? Is it organizing the community? Is it, what, what is the one major lesson as people contemplate uh, pushing for something in their own states? Um, so I, I, I'll bring back something I, I talked about earlier. You, politics is not a spectator sport. And I had a lot of people in I, who would, we'd go around and talk to different groups and be like, like it was deeply personal to them, that they, they wanted to read books by Asian American authors. They wanted to have their history told. But to get them to go to the state capitol, which in Rhode Island, it's kind of a joke, everything's within a half hour of each other, to testify, that, that was seemingly something that they had never thought they could do, they didn't want to do, they, they didn't want to be in public like that. So it, if you are trying to get groups together, if you have people who are hesitant about testifying publicly, I understand there's a lot of issues being you know a little more private in certain cultures than not, um, getting them to write letters is, while not optimal, like you know option A, it's a good option B. And the volume of letters really can help make an influence on legislators. But it, it is not a spectator sport, and you're not going to get this through by um, doing little Facebook posts. You need to have a lot of active pressure. <laughs> and and I, I would I would 100% agree. Um, it is not a spectator sport. Um, I think the Nevada legislature is very different than many other states. We only meet every other year, and we meet for 165 days, and so it's a very tight timeline. However, I think having those coalitions and talking with people and taking the time to have the discussions. Um, I was very fortunate uh, to have the ability to go and talk to my peers who, although they many times did not support it, unfortunately, they brought up concerns and I was able to answer those concerns. And so I think um, talking not only with the other people that care about the bill, but also with the people that don't. Sometimes you'd be surprised about how somebody you think, oh, they're not gonna like this bill. Take the time still to talk with them. It, it makes a big difference because it shows that we might be of a different political party. Um, and in our state, we're, we're not quite 20 minutes, 30 minutes away from each other. We're, we're about eight hours away from the Clark County area where I live. Um, but don't automatically assume that, um, somebody from a different party is not gonna agree with you. Take the time to make those connections, take the time to write those letters and those emails and um, show up. It makes a big difference to have that voice in the room. The testimony of our students makes all the difference in the world. And I just, I wanna really emphasize one thing at Natha just said, this is not a partisan issue. We were talking about this before we went on. I'm a Republican. My sponsor in the Senate was a Democrat. I think that bipartisan support was absolutely key. And so please make sure you're reaching out to members of both parties. You're going to find allies on both sides. Yeah, I think uh, one of the important lessons from Make Us Visible is they really reach out to both sides of the aisle. 
uh, they really want a bipartisan bill. Uh, uh, last question from my end is uh, how, I think Russell passed on this last question, but uh, he could weigh in on this question. How well are teachers prepared to teach Asian American studies? It starts getting into implementation, but in my experience, and please check out our website, asianamericanedu.org, uh, we found uh, three important lessons. One is you have to have the curriculum ready. Um, if you have a one-stop shop, that's better uh, at different grade levels, different subjects, different um, themes. Uh, so have a curriculum ready and we, we could help you uh, prepare your curriculum. Number two is have free trainings for teachers. Uh, we're doing asynchronous trainings and uh, Zoom trainings and eventually we will do in-person trainings. Uh, that, that's very important because um, when we trained uh, 600 teachers in Las Vegas, I would say uh, they were very well intentioned, but 90% plus knew nothing about Asian American studies. So you're less likely to teach if you don't know uh, what you're trying to teach. So uh, you have to have trainings. And the third thing is um, you have to arrange with the districts to get salary point credits. We've gotten salary point credits in Los Angeles, New York, Las Vegas, and other states um, and other localities. That's very important because if the teachers can accumulate enough salary point credits, they could make, for example, five or 6,000 more per year. So that's a financial incentive on top of the moral incentive and the educational incentive. Uh, let me just see if Russell uh, wants to add anything on this question. Yeah, um, I agree with you, Stuart, that you could require this from the top, but unless teachers are ready and prepared, they, they won't teach it well. And Natha said it. If teachers are afraid because they may say something wrong, then they're going to be even less likely to teach about Asian Americans. So I think future policies need to actually, you know, none of these bills actually have teacher training written in. They don't have, very few have funding um, added to the bills because they want it to pass. So once we get this type of legislation passed, we need to take the next step and to seek funding for what you were saying, sir, for teacher training for curriculum development, to pay teachers, to give them stipends to be trained. And I think um, that's the next step. Um, it may be, requiring would be the first step, but teacher training really is the second step in implementation. Barbara and Natha, do you wanna add anything? Yeah, let me just be real quick on that, kind of playing off what Russell said there. It is, there are two separate things. You have to pass the bill first, and then you work on the curriculum. And, and they really are two separate things. You don't write curriculum into legislation in, in detail. And that might not be something that people realize right away. Broad concepts, and then our Department of Education will bring forth the curriculum. We delayed implementation by a year because we wanted to get this bill passed. And then we have a, a year to sit down with all of the stakeholders and again, make these kind of prioritizations of what they wanted to celebrate in their in their culture and make sure it was included um, in the curriculum. When it comes to Russell and, and Stuart mentioned this too about funding, um, we were pretty lucky in Rhode Island where a lot of um, private organizations said so that, you know, if there were a lot of costs um, involved in curriculum development, they would happily supplement this. But we did write it into our basic education plan. So each of the cities and towns can come back up to the state and say, hey, look, we need some more money for this. And that definitely made it a much easier bill to pass when you may, you're saying we will fund this. And that, again, in Rhode Island, it's because it's part of the basic educational plan now. Um, we haven't go so, gone so far as to do teacher stipends. We haven't had to do that on other bills, and I, I wouldn't start there <laughs> anyway. Um, but I think that in the whole um, impetus over the, the last few years about you know broadening our education and making sure other voices are included, that teachers are really excited about this. Um, C100 has some wonderful uh, curriculum materials. I know the Asian American Education make us visible. It, they've started to do this. Um, and I think it's important that we, we try to get as many viewpoints and materials together so that states can, um, I would say this, make it frugal on their end as well. So thank you. So I'll make 
really quick because uh, I think all the points I would have said have already been stated, but just like politics is not a spectator sport, legislation is not a uh, hundred yard dash. It's usually a marathon with a relay marathon where one um, legislator might start off with something and then you have to hand it over to somebody else or even hand it, keep on going throughout each session, um, subsequent sessions. So we have to start thinking about this as a step-by-step -step and not just a, we're gonna get it all done in one session. It's gonna be a process. And I think this is part of the process that needs to be discussed. Um, let me give the uh, panelists uh, 30 seconds to close out uh, and then uh, I think we've run out of time. So we're gonna have to move on to uh, the president of the C-100. But uh, let me just say that all of the panelists, uh, including myself, uh, we put our emails uh, in the chat. And so please contact us for more um, partnership opportunities, anything we could do to help you uh, in this very, very important effort uh, we'll do if we can can do it at all. Uh, so Russell, do you want to just close out? I just want to thank Committee of 100 again for their excellent report. Congratulations and for this um, great panel, I'm honored to join. Um, we at Stop AAPI Hate are making education one of our top initiatives. Again, most Americans say that education is the best way to combat racism. So if any of you in the audience um, are with groups who want to um, require Asian American studies or want to make sure it's implemented well. Um, we at Stop API Hate want to join you in your efforts. Um, we, we have staffing and um, youth who also want to help out. So feel free to contact us. Thanks a lot. Uh, Natha? Um, thank you again for this opportunity. And I, I think this is probably one of the most important steps, and that's talking about it with each other. We have to stop um, creating barriers for us and just sit down and talk and sometimes have those uncomfortable conversations where we say that there's a problem, but we need to find solutions. So I so appreciate again, uh, the committee of 100 and everybody's participation. And I look forward to working with you guys in the future as well. Thank you again. Barbara. Thanks Stuart and thanks to Ambassador Locke, C100. Um, this is so important and I, you know, there's so many different viewpoints on here and I've really talked a lot about the education. But as far as making sure that your own state um, is represented, if there are issues with logistics and how do you pass these bills, don't be afraid to, to reach out to any of us. And it's so important sometimes to don't get bogged down in little gritty details. You know, just try to come together and, and always present a united front when you're coming into these issues. If they if you're in a legislation and um, they sense some fracturing, you're less likely to move forward that year. Um, but again, there's there's all types of little nuances that we can all help you walk through. And uh, I'm so excited to be part of this. And thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, our goal at Asian American Education Project is to reach 1 million American youth of all different ethnicities within the next five years. By partnering with each of you, uh, we'll be able to reach that goal much sooner and expand that goal uh, numerically. So we hope to work with you. Uh, Nantha, uh, Barbara, Russell, Irene, uh, the Committee of 100 staff and uh, leadership. Uh, we look forward to working with all of you uh, much more in the near future. Uh, so please give the questions to um, the panelists or to the Committee of 100, uh, both uh, would be preferable. And let me close this out by turning to Zi Wong, the president of the Committee of 100, to say some final words. Hello, I am Zi Wong, the president of Committee of 100. It's great to have all of you join us tonight for this much needed discussion. I want to thank our moderator and Committee of 100 member, Stuart Cole, for taking the time to lead this discussion. And a special thank you to our panelists, Dr. Russell June, Assemblywoman, Natha Anderson, and State Representative Barbara Ann Fenton Fong. Thank you all for your time, energy, and passion for this very important topic. I want to thank the attendees for joining us tonight. I hope you find the experiences shared by our speakers on expanding AAPI curriculum useful and actionable. We hope they also inspire more discussions and actions on this important topic. A short survey will pop up 
on your browser when this webinar ends. Please take a couple minutes to give us feedback. Once again, thank you for joining us tonight. Have a great evening.